what up what up folks what's going on welcome to the spun today podcast spun today spun to spun 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 today podcast the only podcast that is anchored in writing but unlimited in scope i'm your host tony ortiz and i appreciate you listening this is episode 211 of the spun today podcast and in this episode i have yet another throwback episode for you I hate to do that to you fine folks in two episodes back to back, but the episode that I was prepping to release today was not quite ready yet. And it was either rush it to get it in and deliver something that I wouldn't really be happy with or make sure I get it up to snuff for episode 212. And I went with the latter. But this throwback episode is going to be very apropos because it's dropping on July 7th, 2022, the day after I'm recording this intro, which is my firstborn's birthday. Aiden turns four years old. And this episode is one that I created a couple weeks after he was born. And it was originally released on July 26th, 2018. I know it's a cliche thing to say, but time really does fly. And I'm always reminded of that joke or that line that I'm not sure who to attribute it to, but that saying of, you know how people say life is short? It's not because it's the longest thing that any of us ever do. Be that as it may, in terms of technically correct, it doesn't change the fact that relative to watching your children grow up, for my fellow parents out there, it's like you blink and a few years have passed. And it's not really until you take time to stop and think and reminisce on different times you've had with them that you realize just how much time has passed. And this episode is that for me. Apologies in advance for the bad editing back in 2018 in terms of just leaving extra dead air and ums and and ands and sucking of the teeth and stuff like that in there. And just the sound quality in general, but it's a cool episode for me to listen to again just in from a reminiscent mindset and checking in on how i was feeling at the time but it's also good for new parents or expecting parents to listen to and even existing parents to help jog their memories of things that they went through within the first couple weeks after having a newborn at home and i speak about the experience of being at the hospital a day before he was born the actual delivery, the recover, the recovery of my wife afterwards, leaving the hospital. I speak about the first few nights at home as new parents and just how life changed for us. And the fun fact, Aiden, and my real ride or die spun today listeners might know this, is the voice you hear in the outro of every episode for, I want to say, at least two, maybe three years of the Spun Today podcast where the, at the very, very, very end in every episode, after my outro, after the ending credits, if you will, like where I, I tell you guys uh, about different ways that you can help support the show. And even after the outro music, there's a drop of Aiden saying this. I love you, Aiden. I love you, Daddy. And I remember we recorded that getting ready for bed one night. I wanted to like capture that moment and recorded it on my phone. He wasn't, he couldn't have been even like two years old. It was like one and change, almost two maybe. But yeah, man, it's definitely been one of the greatest experiences of my life. Raising little, little humans. (laughs) And it all started with baby Aiden. Now, without further ado, I'm going to tell you guys about a quick way that you can help support the Spun Today podcast. If you so choose. And then we'll jump right into the episode. You can support the Spun Today podcast by going to spuntoday.com forward slash support. There you'll find my merch section where you can cop the iconic podcasts versus anybody t-shirt in a wide variety of different colors and all different sizes. Also, if you're into cycling, you can cop the super soft, comfortable, minimalist design Spun Today Bike Club t-shirt. Also available in a bunch of different colors 
in all different sizes. There are a few other designs of different types of t-shirts. Definitely go there and check it out. Spuntoday.com forward slash support. It's the merch section where you can also get a dope coffee mug. I have coffee mugs with the brand new redesigned Spun Today logo on one side and the tagline that I end every show with on the other, which is start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams. The mug is available in both black and white because we don't discriminate here at the Spun Today podcast. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash support and check out the merch section. Now, let's go to the beginning. And the beginning here is the baby being born. The hours or roughly a day and change that led up to that. So, my wife was 39 and a half weeks pregnant. And it was time for our last uh, appointment, a uh, doctor's appointment. So you have to go every, like when, when you're pregnant, it's usually like every two months in the beginning, then every month, then they switch it to every two weeks, you know, as you um, progress. And then like the last month and a half or two months, it's literally every week you're going in for doctor's appointments. And it's to, to do a sonogram and check on the baby, make sure everything is good, check the um, the woman's vitals and uh, the baby's vitals, and just make sure everything's on point and everything's on track. Then when you're 40 weeks pregnant is when you're already considered full term. I think it's after like 38 weeks, but a pregnancy, a full term pregnancy is 40 weeks, which by the way, 40 divided by four weeks in a month is 10 months. Um, I've had that debate with my wife a bunch and acts like a few different doctors and it works out to like nine and a half months, not necessarily nine and necessarily 10, but whatever, even though pregnancy is thought of as like a nine month thing, which I guess it usually is. Um, and it's broken down into three trimesters. It's 10 months. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it anyway. So she used to, her last appointment was scheduled for a Friday. And on that Friday, she was 39 and it's like 39 weeks and like five days or something like that. And she had like a premonition of let's take our our bag, which I recommend, by the way, anybody who's like going through this, pack your bag like that you're going to take to the hospital. And remember to take stuff for the wife, take stuff for the husband um, and for her. Uh, the baby, like the outfit that you're going to bring him home in. And for the wife, you know, it's comfortable stuff like pajamas, paternity clothes for the husband, you know, underwear, you know, change of clothes, something to sleep in. Remember that you're probably going to be there three to five days, depending on if it's a a natural birth, which my wife had. Uh, you're there for three days, two nights, three days. And if it's a cesarean, you're there for four nights and five days. And... I knew I was going to stay at the hospital with her regardless of if we were able to get a private room or not, which is more comfortable in the private room because you have like a shower and like a separate like sofa that turns into a bed for the spouse. And whereas the the uh, joint room, it's like two people, two different uh, people, um, two different women that just had a baby in the room and you're separated by a curtain. There's like a shared bathroom with no shower and you know there's like a chair that kind of reclines into a bed which is kind of uncomfortable it's a very very tight quarters but i knew those were the two scenarios and we could only get a private room if one freed up because it's uh, based on like a first come first serve after the baby's born you're added to a list and if the room is free then you get it but i knew regardless that i would like tough it out and you know stay with her and the baby in the hospital for those three days. And anyway, so she had the premonition of we were going for this routine appointment, which most likely the final appointment. And uh, she said, let's take the bags just in case, because if they tell us to stay that, you know, the baby's going to be due, you know, or the baby has to come out or whatever. At least we're ready. We don't have to come back home, get the bags and then go back to the city. And that's pretty much how it happened. We went and did the sonogram. The technician that was doing the sonogram 
said that the fluid, the amniotic fluid inside the stomach was a little bit low and that she wanted the doctor to come take a look. And since she's full term already anyway, at 39, 39 and a half weeks, um, that was a Friday. The, the actual due date for the baby was that following Monday. And she, uh, she said that the doctor might advise uh, just to go and check yourself in uh, to the hospital uh, right after that appointment. And she got the doctor. The doctor reviewed everything and agreed. You know, everything was fine with the baby. Nothing. Uh, he wasn't in danger or anything like that. Uh, but the fluids were low enough to um, go into labor, pretty much. To be, it would have been a concern if we went home, basically. And that's how it happened. We went from there, um, where the appointment was, to uh, like another floor. The appointment is like on a 10th floor. This was in NYU Hospital here in New York and NYU Langone. And we went to the eighth floor, which is where you do like the check in and stuff like that for delivery. And they advise you to do, which we did, an online course, which is called Ready Set Baby. And I'm sure different hospitals have like their versions of. Some of them used to do it like in person. But the floor that they do it on is actually like where women deliver the babies. So instead of doing it in person, at least NYU chose to switch it to an online version, which is really cool, really informative. And we took that course and it's pretty much like a webinar and for like an hour, hour and a half. And it shows you like what floor to go to, what you have to do, you know, and we did exactly that and everything exactly as stated. And we went, uh, we had pre-filled like our birth plan and um, insurance paperwork and stuff like that. So uh, when we checked in, my wife, and we did all that because of the Ready, Set, Baby video. It advised to do all that so you could get all that shit out of the way. Instead of getting to the hospital and having to fill out like a booklet worth of information when your wife is going into labor, you know. So uh, all my wife had to do was show her ID and they pretty much uh, uh, checked her in. And... Uh, they checked us in, and it's still, like, surreal at this point, you know? The We're, like, going through the motions, and we're like, wow, I can't believe, I, I guess it's really going to happen, that's it. We're not leaving this hospital until without a baby, you know? And the they check us in, and the first thing is that they put us in, like, this tiny room that it's like a, a closet converted into a room. And they the nurses were explaining to us that it was so packed um after uh, july 4th uh this was july 6th that we went into the hospital friday july 6th and she said that it's been so packed um after july 4th weekend like every woman that was pregnant decided to have the baby after the fireworks um that there weren't any rooms and we had to stay in that room um which was it was good and bad because it was small, it was tight, um, but it was technically private, you know, uh, for because for the first, prior to delivery, for the first, you know, until you're ready to go into the delivery room, you're in a bigger room with like four, I think it's like four different women um, uh, per room, which is different from what I mentioned before, like the, the recovery rooms when you already have the baby and you're like in a shared room with one other person but this is prior to delivery you're in a room with like four different women but since all those were were booked and taken we were in kind of like this small little broom closet type room which worked out because we had like a little more privacy Uh, so we're there meeting meeting the nurses which are working on like eight hour shifts so we're meeting like you know different nurses different doctors come they tell me they check my wife she was like one centimeter dilated which means like It's open down there, like one centimeter wide. Uh, Her cervix, I think it is. Or one of the lady parts down there. And you have to be 10 centimeters to begin pushing and, you know, have a baby. And on average, it takes like a couple hours per centimeter. And so what they advised, and which my wife agreed, is that they were going to put in a balloon and uh, a pill i forget what the pill is called like um pitocin or something like that to induce the labor 
to pretty much get the process rolling, you know? And they did that, and that's, like, throughout the entire thing, the time that I felt, like, the worst for my wife was during this, this entering of the balloon thing. So it's like a, like a long syringe type thing that they put inside her. And then the idea is that they fill up, fill it up with like a saline solution or something and then inject the, like the pill into it as well. And this like opens the balloon inside after the, you know, the balloon is in place and they inflate it with that saline solution thing. And that helps to dissolve the cervix walls or uterus walls and you know it induces labor you know look it up if you want like all the technical terms and like stuff like that but pretty much it's what it does you know balloon goes in they inflate it it opens up and it kind of gets the ball rolling it's a teaching hospital NYU is so you you have oftentimes and we even saw this when we went on regular routine appointments you have the doctor and then the the practicing uh doctor doing their their residency and uh you know you could like opt out opt in of it of it or whatever you know there's different schools of thoughts um on that some people say they want the actual doctor doing it some people say that they want they rather the student doing it because the student is literally like in school you know just finished doing it and they're the ones that usually do it anyway because people don't normally opt out and um uh, that was the case here like we went with the student and you know the doctors are literally right next to them telling them what to do and stuff and she you know was inserting everything it was hurting my wife a little bit and but she couldn't quite get in where she needed to get and so then the doctor uh decided to to try and the doctor like went in there in a way that was so super painful to my wife that she started like screaming crying and she still couldn't get the device in where she needed to get it because she like went in there with her hand and like moving stuff around and um it was like super super painful i think that was seemingly more painful to my wife than the entire like labor experience like she started crying like literally crying and um they when the doctor pulled her hand out like it was like full of blood which got me like a little worried like i was like like i look at her and I, you know my wife she just has her head back and she's crying but i look at the doctor and i'm like bitch is this normal you know what i mean like i'm like thinking to myself like i look at her in a way that is at least to me you know like that's the question i had in mind and you know based on like their body language and stuff like that it seemed to be uh fine and they said that it's normal and and whatever but they said that they were going to give her a break before like trying again and that they would try a different way to insert the balloon and induce her uh, that should be less painful and they did that they left came back 15 20 minutes later and they pretty much like propped my wife up like she had to like sit up you know like when you're kind of doing like sit-ups um or like pelvic like thrusts up in the air and you're on your back it was like something like that and they propped her up like put something like under her back to prop her up a bit um they had like this duck looking shoehorn thing to like open her up and then another the other nurse had like a flashlight like a literal like plumber's flashlight type of thing and they went in there slipped it right in and this time it was like painless like it didn't hurt her at all which begs the question why isn't that way the first way that you go about it you know what i mean um but whatever then after that it was pretty much oh, a waiting game and we uh they were checking my wife every one to two hours and literally after like three or four hours she was only like four centimeters and by this point like i had spoken to my family and her family and there was a, a bunch of them in uh the waiting area you know waiting because we don't know you know it could literally take a couple hours and the baby would be there or it could be you know the next day um, which is what it wound up being but uh, at that point it was literally just like a straight up waiting game and like my parents were there my brother was there and my 
my father-in-law who flew in from the Dominican Republic was there as well and my brother-in-law and sister-in-law and my other sister-in-law and shout out to everybody for being there my aunt was there and it was just cool it was like a, a cool like family oh shit moment you know what I mean and like everybody came in to like kind of like say bye and like good luck and like stuff like that to my wife and um pretty much after a few hours when we found out that um she was only like three or four centimeters dilated and like the doctor said that they knew like this wasn't gonna happen until like the next day she was gonna take a long time like dilating and stuff so i told the family that Uh, most everybody went home my sister-in-law and brother-in-law stayed behind um overnight they wound up like sleeping in the uncomfortable waiting room area which is tough too that's like another side that that doesn't get spoken about enough i think which is like all the family like waiting because you always see family in like waiting rooms and like they're like just waiting you know like they're not like going through the actual experience and i've been on like the waiting room side of things like when my nieces were born and um just like visiting people in the hospital in general like somebody's going through surgery or something like that it's like the family's like going through a lot too you know like in the in the waiting room just waiting hoping to hear something i'm trying to think if anything else happened that first anything else of substance happened that first night i think that was pretty much it that first night and i think very very late that night they transferred us to the room where she was gonna give birth and like that's a huge room that's a really big room it has uh, a couch that turned into a bed and you know it has like all the utensils or tools or whatever that the the delivery doctor is gonna use and the nurses and has a bathroom in there um uh, no shower but a regular bathroom and a sink and mirror and you know the whole nine has a whole bunch of stuff in there very very roomy all right so then very late they uh they moved us into that room and then there is just more of a waiting game you know they check on her pretty much every hour and you you know you have to get to that 10 centimeter point so by this point also my wife had the epidural uh put in she didn't want to feel shit (laughs) and she has said from the beginning she was like i'll take the epidural the day before if i can fucking a week before you know whatever whatever makes like the the pain easier and she got the epidural so she could and so that eased like a lot of her pain and once the epidural is in they also put like a catheter in so she can uh pee so she could urinate uh, through it so she doesn't have to get up anymore and go to the bathroom um and she's also since like they check her in like she was only on liquids um she couldn't eat like any any food or anything like that and it was only like chicken broth water and tea like she couldn't like drink anything else or or anything i snuck her in some like ginger ale and gave her a few sips of it that's her her, like comfort drink food thing um but that was pretty much it um and the whole time again it's just a waiting game waiting game you're waiting to get to 10 centimeters um then what else then the rest of the family went home and like showered and changed and the, everybody was going to gear up to come back later on in the afternoon you know we're more or less gauging and asking like the nurse and doctor and stuff like that at that point you know is it sometime tonight sometime you know when do you think so we could let the family know etc cetera, etc cetera. and um and by then we've had like a bunch of nurses because remember it's every like eight hour shift so we, we were on a, like, like our third or fourth nurse because the one like when we just checked in there was like a shift about to end like a half hour later or something like that or an hour later so we met like one and then another one like that night then the next morning was a different one then eight hours later another one so we we're like on our third or fourth nurse all of them were super cool super nice very helpful answered all our questions very very welcoming um you know, no cold, no, no, like, rushing you, no, like, oh, that's a dumb question, or, oh, let us, or, you know, like, none of that, like, they understand, like, all the emotions and stuff like that going on, and, um, they were great, they were definitely great, and the doctor, the delivering doctor, shout out to Dr. Ruggiero, 
was amazing. She was so cool. So, like, she was born to do what she does. Like, at first, she comes off as, like, a touch over the top. <laughs> and because you don't know if it's, like, are you, like, overdoing it on purpose? Are you, like, faking? But it's not. It's just, like, real caring like and she's like oh we're gonna have a baby today it's gonna be awesome we're gonna have a birthday party today's gonna be your baby's birthday this is so amazing it's so beautiful and um she was really cool she was like a like a cheerleader doctor in one which is which you need that that levity in the room i feel um just to keep everybody on uh everybody's mood where it needs to be or where it should be or where it's most helpful for it to be and what was most telling about her to me is that she kept this like calm demeanor while doing the whole like cheerleader thing and had full control of every single person in the room because i'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and then come back like towards the because i just don't want to forget this point towards the end when my wife is like pushing the baby's almost almost gonna come out she like she uh had told us that there's gonna be a few more people coming to the room which is a nurse that is dedicated strictly to the baby um so they could focus one laser focus on the baby um when the baby comes out the doctor that delivers the baby she which is the one i'm speaking of she continues to uh focus on my wife along with the nurse that's been there the whole time and you know they have to like you know it's a it's a natural birth but you still have to do a little sewing you know i had some stitches down there because it stretches a lot and um i asked her to put a few extra stitch, stitch, stitches down there I'm joking i'm joking <laughs> um but you know they also have to monitor my wife because you know she's losing blood and stuff like that uh which is a whole wild experience but anyway she you know there's another lady that does like the the footprints and you know uh there's a few more there's like four more people that were in the room that weren't there before and she has like full gauge of everybody what everybody's doing and what everybody's supposed to be doing and in one uh point i caught her telling like this lady had her back to my wife and she was like uh telling my wife that all right with the next contraction do a few more big pushes whatever and then she turns to the lady and she's like oh do you need that um do you want to grab that suction thing uh right there and the lady kind of she was caught off guard and she was like huh oh yeah and that was her way of telling her yo bitch turn around the baby's coming with the next push but she didn't tell us that um she was just making sure that everybody was paying attention everybody was like on point um and she just wanted us or my wife rather in the position of you know just do a few more big pushes with the next contraction when it comes and um as we've been doing pretty much for the for the past hour um but i thought that was like really telling and really cool about her all right so let's go back pretty much while we're in the room the doctor comes in and out every hour and the nurse as well and they're checking on my wife and you know it's six centimeters seven centimeters eight centimeters so we're getting close and then my wife was the and the doctor always told her when the contractions feel constant because she would still feel the contractions she would still feel the pressure from the contractions even though she had the epidural in but it wasn't as intense um that epidural helps ease it um and it's so much so that my wife was like i feel like a period cramp pain but it like comes and goes but though but i don't think they're contractions because you know the doctors kept saying oh when you have a contraction you'll know and i was like maybe that is a contraction so because you have that but they're not blah 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 and one of the nurses pretty much told us because there's like this machine that prints out it looks like a like a lie detector test type of thing and every like peak is a contraction and it was like she was like oh yeah you're contracting like every two minutes um, you just like don't feel it in the beginning because it's not as intense, and then plus with that epidural, you feel it even less. But yeah, you've been contracting for hours, and we were like, "Oh shit, that's crazy." <laughs> um, and then you know from that point on, like I could like monitor her contractions like on the little chart thing and see how frequent they were. And pretty much the doctors told us that when the contractions feel constant and she feels a, a need to push, like she has to poop, like she has to take a shit 
then that's pretty much going to be go time. You know, they'll check the centimeters and then let us know. But um, that's what it is. So we got to that point and she checked my wife's centimeters and my wife was nine and a half centimeters. So yeah, we know it's go time. And we're in the room. It's the doctor, the nurse, my wife, obviously, myself and my sister-in-law, Julie. I'm holding my wife's left leg. Like that's my like station. And the nurse is holding my wife's right leg. And the doctor's, you know, front and center. And Julie's like behind um behind us and uh like holding my wife's hand and you know, like calming her down and keeping her calm. And the doctor is you know, there's a monitor on the baby to monitor his his uh like heartbeat and and stuff and make sure you know he's doing okay throughout the process it's like a bitch of a process for him too you know he goes through a lot that day and you know which with each contraction pretty much it's wait until it gets intense take a deep breath and then myself and the nurse are like hold my wife's legs and like push them in towards her and she's like pushing out and that helps you know push the baby down and throughout this it's like three big pushes that they actually do during the contractions like while the contraction is going on and when you push my wife according to my wife you like you feel alleviated like you feel like you have to push it's not like you you're trying to avoid pushing i always thought it was the other way around i always thought like you didn't want to push and it hurt when you push um, but my wife was like, no, it's like the opposite. It's like, you want to push, you have the sensation to push. And then like the doctors even, uh, like we would do one contraction push and then the other contraction rest. Cause the, like the baby's heart rate would like go down a bit, like after each contraction. So they wanted it to level out during the next contraction and then try pushing again during the other contraction. So it was like push every other contraction basically. Um, cause the baby like, didn't like it. I would, like, it was like strain for him, you know? And they tell that by, you know, monitoring his heart. And, but then like towards the end, like it wasn't just straining him at all. Like he wanted to be done with it more than anybody else probably. And his heart rate was like fine. And we just get pushing, pushing, pushing to like pretty much every contraction towards the end. But, <clears throat> and, you know, the doctor was uh you know push and then rest and then then at first like i was like oh shit you know it's gonna be like three or four pushes that's it the baby's gonna be here but it wasn't that it was of that scenario that i just painted of you know pushing during the contraction waiting for the next contraction which was more painful on my wife's side because she didn't get to push so she didn't feel like the relief of pushing and then re-pushing again for the next contraction like that interval that lasted like over an hour like doing that and we started like at i think it was like 6 45 6 50 of like the first push and the baby was actually born at 8 15 p.m on july 7th and i thought i would i felt like surprisingly calm throughout the entire thing and i thought i would be like a nervous wreck um but i was pretty much like just focusing going through the motions picking up on the cues from the doctors and nurses the doctor and nurse and uh like when the nurse would not tell her during one contraction to uh you know wait until it gets intense take a deep breath push like i would say it um i would ask if she wants water and i would reach over grab grab a cup of water with a straw feed her a little bit of water and which was cool by the way because my sister-in-law told me that when she had her baby um she like they didn't allow her to like drink anything like she could only have like ice chips up to a certain point and then after that like she couldn't even drink water or anything like while she was pushing um and that was like with my my, my first niece or second niece was born i don't know which one or probably both because she had them both at the same hospital but it was cool that you know, my wife actually got that bit of relief of able to, to drink some water. So I was just in that like mode of transmit the necessary information, make sure, 
she's doing well keep my eye like on the doctor and the nurse you know trying to read like their body language and um they're you know she's like keeping the room calm and i can tell that she's not freaking out about anything so like i was good and she actually like left the room also a few times and the nurse would just do the pushing part so then that to me was oh, okay so this isn't like uh like it's gonna be a while of pushing like we're going through this like pushing motion like pushing the baby further down 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 because if the you know the baby was close to coming then i'm pretty sure the doctor wouldn't like leave the room and uh, but she would leave and she would check on like other patients and stuff and then come back and then the nurse would stay there the whole time and she went through like a couple of contractions um with us just us and my wife was doing great like she you know it wasn't like a lot of pain um well let me not speak for her <laughs> it wasn't for me from the outside looking in it didn't seem as painful as she did also uh say this also uh to me after the fact that it wasn't like in the beginning at least and even towards the end like it wasn't as painful as that balloon thing uh was in the very beginning the, the day before when they induced her and what else was interesting oh the the doctors like after every push um they they have blue gloves and they have brown gloves and the, they use the brown gloves when she's pushing and they're like looking in and seeing you know looking around and making sure she's pushing correctly and i don't know what they're looking for i guess like for the baby's head or something um and then after every contraction after every push they throw away that glove and get another one which is interesting i was like a little nervous at first like when the doctor left the room like probably like two or three times and we were there with just the nurse but then i was like calm because i was like all right you know it's just gonna like take a minute and then like when the doctor starts saying all right you know three or four more like big pushes like this and we'll be there you you have your baby it'll be, we'll be having a birthday party blah 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 and then like i took her three or four pushes to really be like you know six or seven um and maybe you know she was just trying to not to make it seem like such a big thing because my wife was like getting tired and stuff and uh but then when she started talking to us about you know other people are gonna enter the room and do i want to uh cut the umbilical cord etc i said yes and it was part of our birth plan and i told her also that we wanted to do the delayed delayed cord clamping and she said that that as long as everything seems normal that you know we'll do that but if she sees that there's any like issues or something that she might be concerned about um she would cut it herself and you know she would have to make that decision when the time comes but if not then then we'll do the delayed cord clamping and what the delayed cord clamping is that instead of cutting the umbilical cord right, right away when the baby comes out is there's an option of delayed cord clamping which is leaving the umbilical cord attached to the baby for up to three minutes which allows like several more more pumps of blood to your baby when the baby's out of the womb and from what i looked up beforehand which is um you know why i spoke to my wife about it and we decided to go with it is that it's good for studies have shown that when you do delayed cord clamping your baby has less of a chance to getting jaundice or anemia and they get some extra red blood cells in their system um as infants which is like good for them for their development or something like that so it was like positive things there's like no risk to it and unless the doctor sees that for whatever reason they have to you know cut the baby out because they have to do something with the baby you know god forbid like resuscitate them or something like that they would have to like cut them off um immediately so luckily everything was fine oh but let me not skip that part anyway so she's you know she starts speaking about that type of thing and telling us about the people that are coming into the room etc so now i know it's like getting towards the end and at this point i could see the baby's head he's like the top of his head uh we could see you know i'm holding her leg i'm looking down and and she's been for the past like few contractions that she's pushed like the baby hasn't gone past a certain point and 
um she was like speaking in like hospital lingo code to the nurse about a couple things and her tone seemed you know normal seemed fine but something about it made it made me think like oh shit you know something might be wrong um and then she mentioned like all these other people coming into the room and stuff like that i'm not sure if that part is normal or not but maybe it has something to do with the fact that you know she can't push the baby past a certain point or hasn't been able to yet and she's getting tired um you know i've read of or heard of situations where you're pushing 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 for a long time and then you wind up having to have a c-section anyway because you can't get the baby out so i thought maybe it was we were like i felt like we were getting close to that threshold of that possibility and then a few more big pushes by the way i audio recorded a bunch of this i'm gonna see if i can drop some of it into uh the background here uh, for you guys to hear because i wanted to have the obviously i'm into audio shit right i have a podcast but i wanted to have the first sound of my child on earth have it and be able to like listen to it whenever i wanted um and for him in the future when he hears it, i think it'll be it'll be it would definitely would have been something i would get a kick from out of like hearing myself cry at birth or something you know so maybe he he'll be into it and if not then i am so anyway um and you know you're not allowed to like video record or, or anything like that you could take pictures um but no video and i just had like audio recording like from my pocket allegedly maybe i or maybe not i don't know um so the last contraction uh, my wife is pushing and she's like oh no now she's in pain because uh the baby was crowning which means like the head was like right at the tip and it's been there for a minute and she's pushing and, and she's like oh my god just get it get him out of me already please and like she's starting to get to be in a lot more pain than before and this time the doctor was telling her to push 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 um and instead of doing three pushes we, we did four pushes and that was different and that was and the doctor was more engaged like in her pushing like she was waiting for the baby to come out i thought uh because before like she would do push 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 and she would be looking and seeing the baby's head and, and like checking like the angles i guess and then that'll be one push and then the second push you know she's still there and then by the third push she's just telling her to push but she's like not even looking anymore um so i know that the baby's not coming out then you know uh, but it was more to like push the baby down or get him in the right position etc until the next contraction but now she said to do a fourth push and she was engaged with the third push and with the fourth push and i'm like there watching intently and his head comes out, and then the rest of him just slithers out. Okay. All right, let's go. Grab behind this Grab leg. Behind your legs. And push. Push. A little bit more, a little bit more. Harder, harder, harder. Good, 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 good. Excellent good job. hug. Good job. Okay, good. Do it again. Big deep breath. Good. Excellent. Good, good, good. Keep going. A little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. Perfect. Good. And again, one more. A little more. Good, good. Yes, girl. Yes, yes, yes. Claire, do you want this ball? Do you want that suction ball? Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Good. She's got a nice size head. Okay. I want you to let that breath out. I want you to push one more time for me. Okay, push one more time. All right. Okay, push one more time for me. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Give us a towel. All the pictures you want. Yeah, baby. Yeah. 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 Oh my god. Oh, that's a nice baby. Boy or girl, what have you gotten? How much? That what looks, time? baby looks good. Good job. Congratulations. Oh, that's nice. Alright, now it's a pleasure. Oh my god. Oh my god! Look at 
Oh, boy. Aiden. Mira la mano en la boca. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And. Welcome to the world. I'm like. At a loss. And. It's like scary. And the baby comes out. When he comes out, it's not like he's like pristine, you know, clean, you know, baby with a rattle or something like that. He's like a little bluish because the blood hasn't like flowed through his entire body yet. And so that's like a little scary to see at first. Like you don't hear him right away because they have to like unclog his nose and his throat. And, you know, he like on the way out, they swallow like amniotic fluid and a whole bunch of shit. Which, by the way, like, the next night he was, like, spitting up. And it's completely normal. But they, like, spit up some of that amniotic fluid and it looks like blood. But you, like, freak the fuck out. Anyway, so the baby comes out. And my wife feels, like, relieved. And we do, we opted in to do skin to skin. Which is, they literally take the baby. They unclog them and put them right on the mother's skin. Um, right after birth, you know, it's still umbilical cord is still clamped on and everything. And they do the skin to skin for, I think it's like an hour and they do everything to the baby while the baby's on skin to skin. And the point is to, so you can feel the mother's warmth and feel comfort and smell, smell the mom and the mom and baby could bond. And, um, you know, they take the baby out. Part of me is, uh, like in awe of wow the baby came out like this journey that we've been on for the past nine months and culminated over the last uh, couple days and intensified over the last few hours is now done um so part of me is like in shock with that the other part of me is like worried about my wife and you know i know this was like a lot of stress on her and her body and you know any woman uh but my wife was like super tired and she she i could see there was like a lot of blood i don't know i don't have like a frame of reference to like gauge it on but like she did lose a lot of blood um and her like blood pressure was low so we were like worried like the first like night or two and but then her blood pressure normalized which was awesome but you know another the other part of me was like with her and like i was like staying with her and i was still in shock and then a third part of me is kind of sort of gauging the doctor i'm I'm thinking about the delayed cord clamping and she was pretty much like if we do the delayed cord clamping that means you know uh everything's fine you can cut the umbilical cord but if there's something wrong i'm gonna have to cut it so i was kind of sort of waiting to see if she was if she cut it or not and she didn't so that like set me more at ease so then i could like appreciate the moment a little more and a co-worker of mine about less than a week before uh, my son was born, had his first daughter. And, like, he texted me about it, like, afterwards. And uh, it was probably, like, a couple of days before uh, this happened. And we went to the hospital. And he told me. And I told him, like, how'd it feel, you know, whatever. Because he was, like, super nervous about the whole thing. He told me that he never thought that he could love someone so much. And... The stuff that you usually, I've heard before, you know? And one of the things that he said was that didn't, that I hadn't heard before and that I was kind of sort of waiting to see what would happen was that they were, that he cried like the greatest cry ever. And I think he called it that, like a great, wonderful cry. And... Like, I know, like, I'm an emotional person for certain things. And, like, when a child is born, obviously you cry, right? Like, if you don't, I don't know, teach his own. But, like, I expect to cry. You know, it's kind of like the emotion that goes with childbirth. It's like, what's supposed to happen here? You're supposed to cry, you know? But I didn't know. Like, I didn't, I didn't, not I didn't know. It's like I, I expected to, but I didn't like want it just because oh yeah let me cry because i just had a baby or whatever you know and it like when it happened i did cry and when it happened like 
that great cry that he was referencing like that he was like very specific about um and after the fact he actually texted me and he asked me like did you have that great cry when it happened i knew what he meant and like when before i had to cut the umbilical cord when i noticed you know they were doing the skin to skin the baby was like wiggling around moving blood was beginning to flow like to his face and towards his hands and arms and stuff and he was crying a little bit and he didn't even cry that much um i like let out a cry that felt it felt like my throat was crying if that makes any sense like it was like waterworks like from my eyes like just came out like it wasn't like it wasn't forced it wasn't like pushed it wasn't like oh my god yeah like it, it felt like liquid was just like coming out of my eyes and like if like so much that it felt like not that i cried like so much so much but i'm saying it felt so like automatic flow that it felt like it was coming out of my throat too i don't know if that makes sense but whatever that's like how i felt i just felt like liquid it was just like coming out of me and then i remember my sister-in-law actually um was telling me touch him touch him go go um because i was just like there like crying and like holding my wife and i hadn't like touched the baby or anything and then like i, I went around and i like put my finger and he like grabbed my hand and, like squeezed my hand and that was just amazing and like everyone in the room is happy and at this point i'm i'm listening again to to come back a little bit to reality and i hear like the baby nurse saying that's a healthy baby and then the then the delivery doctor saying um telling me okay so you ready to to cut the umbilical cord and uh, i said yes and then she told me she started telling me how it's gonna feel and i've heard before that it's like it's like slippery and it's like a calamari or whatever like that so i and people had told me that they had trouble like cutting it and like the scissor you know like when you try to cut something the scissor slips and it goes like sideways kind of so i was expecting that so i knew that you know like when that happens what do you do you take the scissor you put whatever you're gonna cut all the way towards the back of the scissor and instead of trying to cut in one swoop you do like like three four or five like small little tiny like up down up down up down up down to like actually like cut through um so i knew that that's how i was gonna cut it and then when she said you know if it's like cutting like calamari kind of or like a squid it's a little slippery um that like re-triggered that in my mind and i knew how i was gonna cut it and then she told my sister-in-law to go on the opposite side so she'd get a picture of me cutting the umbilical cord which is really cool that she thought of that and uh, i cut it perfectly uh she said like a pro but she probably tells all the dads that um <laughs> and from there we were just with the baby with our son with baby aiden aiden ortiz and my sister-in-law went out to let all the family know that was in the in the waiting room uh, that the baby was born, that everything was good. And I told them that I would go out, you know, whenever I could, once things, like, settled down. And I didn't want to leave yet anyway. And um, it's cool when uh, they, NYU is, like, a baby-friendly hospital. And they don't, they don't, like, take the baby away for anything. Like, normally they would take the baby away to, like, put the vitamin, uh, vitamin, like, something in his eye. They do that to, like, shield against, like, blindness because of, like, the bacteria and the amniotic fluid and stuff like that. Uh, they did that while he was, like, laying on my wife. They gave him the the shot of vitamin K right when he was, like, laying on my wife. And he took that like a, like a champ. And uh, we were just there. And they were, like, cleaning up the blood. And I saw that it was a lot of blood. So now I started, like, worrying more about my wife. Um, they were, like, sewing her, stitching her up and uh she started feeling like a lot of pain and they had to get the anesthesiologist again to like top her off and like numb her um you know so my focus went like back more towards her and yeah i mean after that once everything settled like there was a bunch of blood like all over the floor uh because she did lose a lot of blood and they had to like get somebody to come in and like mop it up 
and we we're doing the skin to skin still and it was just just like an awe moment then after a while i i don't remember if i went out to the waiting room before or after there was like another nurse doctor lady that comes in that measures the baby you know like takes his weight and uh after this is like after the skin to skin after like the hour-long skin to skin session thing and they take the baby and they oh wait wait before that the lady that does like the footprints i don't know if i said that already uh, she does the footprints also while the baby is like in uh, my wife's arms and doing skin to skin and they take his footprint which is pretty cool and then you know they clean him off and then later on once they finish with skin to skin uh the nurse the other nurse comes in and that does the the weight and the length and um she did that and you know it's the first time i take the baby away from my wife and i was like standing like right next to her the whole time like watching what she was doing and again going off of like her body language and, and stuff like that and she seemed a little bit concerned when she was like patting pat patting him like on his back she said that she, he had like a lot of fluid in him still and she had like this she grabs like this um oxygen mask thing and i thought she was gonna put it on him and like i was that kind of like freaked me out a little bit um like internally i'm like oh fuck i hope he's okay and she just used that you know it wasn't to put it on him she just used that to like pat him more on the back and make him like spit up um because again he we wound up finding out that he just had like a lot of like amniotic fluid like in the system and shit still that he swallowed like on the way out um so but she's you know patting him on the back and and making him spit up and stuff like that and she said that he's okay that she got a lot of it out and she said that he's good he's healthy um he was born seven pounds eight ounces 20 inches long and he was born on july 7th 2018 at 8 15 p.m and then he went back with mommy uh did more skin to skin and he was such a good baby like he wasn't like he he started sucking his thumb like almost immediately <laughs> which is cool and like interesting to see and in his sonograms i don't know if, i don't remember if i told you guys or not like a lot of his sonogram pictures like he had his hands like by his face like he still has like those mannerisms which is which is interesting which is cool and then i went out to eventually to the waiting area and like the first person i saw was my mom which is cool because it's like the whole time i'm thinking like how my mom did that with like me and my brother and especially back in the day like with probably like no epidural she had a c-section i don't know if she had epidural or not or even if they give epidural for C-sections, but they must give something, I think. Um, but she was, like, the first one that I saw, like, turning, like, the little corner. She, like, ran up to, like, hug me and stuff, and then my dad and, and my brother and then everybody else in the family. And it was an awesome moment. It was, like, a picture-perfect moment, like, exactly how I wanted it to go, how I, I like, envisioned it going. And thankfully, that's how it went. And then everybody came in to like meet the baby and see the baby, and and see my wife and um, yeah. Then everybody gets to go home. Uh, me and my wife were. It was a long day. Super tired. She was exhausted, and you know that's it. Like at this point, that's it. You have a baby. Like the baby stays with you the entire time. And they moved us eventually to that shared room upstairs on a different floor that i told you guys about where pretty much you're going to recover for uh two nights three days before they let you go home and you know we were in a room we and we get there like at i don't even know what time it was the baby was born at 8 15 did an hour of skin to skin probably like another hour of like changing and not changing of like cleaning up and for the family and and then just hanging out in the room for a while and then before they actually moved us 
um, upstairs it was probably like around midnight, 11 p.m., midnight, one, 1 in the morning. I don't even know. But it's late, and we're there. It's dark. Everybody's sleeping. The lady next to us is sleeping. We have a new baby. My wife's exhausted. I'm tired as hell. And we have a baby <laughs> for the first time, you know, like another human being that we're responsible for. And a little bassinet in front of us. And, you know, I'm like pretty much sitting in a chair. She was laying literally like right next to me. I could reach her with my, my elbows. That's how like tight the, that shared room is. And the bassinet is right in front of us. And, you know, that's when it starts. That's when the hissy breathing starts. And, you know, the nurses come in like every hour to check and make sure everybody's awake not awake to make sure everybody she literally said you know i'll be coming in every hour make sure that everybody's good and everybody's still breathing so you guys can try to get some rest um we can take the baby to the nursery also where we have three nurses that are there around the clock and uh they said that you know first-time parents don't want to let the baby go to the nursery and we didn't want to let the baby go to the nursery but that they advised that we should because they know you know we're exhausted and you know it's a long day etc etc and at this point you know like we have to change the diaper we have to uh feed the baby you know my wife we we were doing breastfeeding and supplementing with formula as well and uh my wife uh was breastfeeding and at nyu every nurse is a certified uh lac lactician nur i forgot what they're called but they know they're certified in teaching women how to like breastfeed their babies and they also have like latching hour classes for that and stuff like that but um the nurse like was showing my wife like how to um make them latch on and like breastfeed and stuff like that so that was like super helpful so like whenever the baby cried like we would do that they would uh come in like they changed the diaper a couple times for us and uh they also like swaddle the baby which is really important and you know it makes the baby feel like he's like tight like he's like in a little cocoon like he was like in the womb so it calms him down like allows him to sleep and it also avoids like him like rolling over and uh you know god forbid like on his face or something like that and and that's where like sids could happen like the the baby could like suffocate himself if he rolls over uh, but swaddling him into like this little cocoon thing um helps to avoid that happening and so that first night we definitely like didn't sleep much my i'm still worried about my wife because they come by literally, literally like every hour every two hours to check her blood pressure as well and they do that to like all the women but they kept saying that my her blood pressure was low and you know she's in pain and she just went through the toughest ordeal of her life really and you know i'm worried and we have a new baby that we're like learning how to take care of you know and it's a lot so there was like one point where we like doze off and then like the baby like spits up and then like my wife noticed it and she like like slaps me she's like the baby the baby and like i like jump up and i'm like in a daze like half asleep and uh like i don't see like any vomit or anything and she said yeah he threw up he threw up and he had thrown up before so i thought she was she just woke up freaking out because she like dozed off and like i literally i didn't see anything to this day i told her that he did throw up but that was before and we'd like you know cleaned it up or whatever and he was fine and then she just like re-woke up again like later on like thinking that it was like the other time when he threw up or something i don't know um but like i felt around it like didn't see it or maybe I, I was just fucking half asleep like a zombie but then like the next day like we were like more awake but you know we're getting more and more exhausted so we opted in to letting them uh take him to the nursery and we did it for like that second night was the second night or it was like early in the morning it was like early in the morning like after that first night or something like that um we finally okayed them to take him but only for like two hours <laughs> and then we said we wanted him back because they, they would take him either for 24 hours if you wanted fucking 48 hours whatever you wanted um or for half an hour like whatever you want they do 
and we said okay for for two hours and they brought the baby back and like the nurse was telling us that the baby was like spitting up um whenever they try they fed him like a little formula but that it's normal not to worry uh that the first 24 hours uh they barely eat anything and that they swallowed a lot of amniotic fluid and that they'll spit up and sometimes it might look like blood or something but it's just amniotic fluid it's like if it's a dark in color and not to worry basically and that's pretty much how it went the next night the the next day the lady that was next next to us she got discharged so we had the room to ourselves for a few hours and then the actual private room for the last day like freed up and they asked us if we still wanted it because you have to like pay extra for it they asked us if you still wanted it and we were debating because we had we kind of sort of had the private room to ourselves with the lady that left but they told us that somebody was going to come in like half an hour somebody that was like newly admitted so we just said okay to the private room we figured you know it's going to be our last night we'll sleep comfortably our last night and we get discharged like the 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 next day in the afternoon or whatever so we'll have like the rest of the afternoon on that day which was sunday sunday night and then monday we get discharged and um we'll be a lot more comfortable so we just said fuck it we took it and it was we definitely don't regret that decision then that night the second night we let them take because we knew we had to go home the next night and it was gonna be our first night alone with the baby and um we let them take the baby for probably like five or six hours maybe to the nursery and uh we both slept we got a uh, decent sleep baby came back and that last day they do uh they did like more testing they did a hearing test uh which was cool they put like this these like little gelled on like headphones on them and they run a hearing test and again i'm like looking at the the lady doing the hearing test thing and she's reading off her machine and uh, she's playing sounds and i'm seeing like is the baby supposed to be like moving or reacting like how does she measure like the brain waves and whatever she was measuring and i'm trying to like read her reading the stuff um and everything came out positive he passed it's like a pass fail type of test and they give him like a certificate and everything um and i was laughing i was like oh now he can like listen to to daddy's podcast and listen to podcasts with daddy and stuff in the future um then we something you know we're ready ready to go we were like done with like the whole experience we you know got through everything healthy my wife was good the baby was good and uh, we were ready to be discharged. We, you know, filled all the paperwork, did everything we had to do. And I got the car seat, put him in the car seat. He looks so tiny in the car seat. And, you know, they come uh, with a wheelchair to take my wife downstairs while she's holding the baby. And then I went to get the car, which is parked in the parking lot across the street wrapped around pulled up to the front of the of the hospital and then i uh, you know put the baby in the car seat and walked the baby and my wife over to the car put them in and since this song came out uh and i told my wife about it i was like you know weeks before probably months before the baby was born that on the way home like i have to play just the two of us by will smith and it's because that song always like you know like father son things like get to me and that song always makes me like tear up when i listen to it and i i like loved it since it came out back in the day and i always like envisioned playing that song when driving my kid home from the hospital and thankfully i was able to do that and fulfill that vision i played it i cried <laughs> and I was like driving and it's because like the the content of the song which i'll probably i'll probably use that for this episode um like the first verse or whatever towards the end 
before the uh, ending credits of the uh, of the episode, so you guys can listen to it. But the content of it is, you know, having his first kid, driving home, uh, uh, super slow, and getting mad at the people on the road for driving so fast and reckless, and and wanting to be a good father and putting the the kid safely in his bassinet and not sleeping that night and checking uh, checking the crib or the bassinet rather like all night long and making sure the baby's okay etc like that's the content of it of the song if you haven't heard it yeah it it was a cool drive home and i did drive really slow um i didn't think that slow but when i was like looking at my speedometer i was like driving like 30 miles an hour (laughs) which was pretty slow especially like on the fucking lie going home taking the midtown tunnel driving through the city and shit then we get home, like all the family's home, um, all the family that was waiting in the hospital, they're waiting for us in, here at home, uh, which was really cool. And they had balloons and a uh, welcome, welcome home sign for Aiden. Uh, shout out to Rumi for putting that together. Uh, it was just nice. It was it was family, you know. It was it was definitely memorable. It was dope. Then that night reality hits because it's the first night that you have the baby home you can't give it to trained licensed skilled nurses that do it day in and day out that know how to feed them know how to burp them know how to everything and which by the way they they taught me like how to uh feed the baby also like with the bottle like one of the nurses when i asked her and um all real quick they also gave him like a little sponge bath while he was there in the hospital and he slept four hours out i mean like eight ten hours straight just slept after that first like sponge bath and they say that about babies like when you shower them they like sleep like crazy oh and they give us like this cool a uh, little like nike outfit like nike sponsors the hospital or something like that or at least like that division and they gave him like a little Nike outfit, which is pretty cool. Um, gotta put it on him before he outgrows it. Uh, they gave us like a bunch of like formula and diapers and all types of shit to like take home with us. Yeah, so that first night, it's like we are like terrified. Me and my wife, we uh, decided to take like two hour shifts and she'll stay awake for two hours while I sleep, then I stay awake for two hours while she sleeps. And that didn't work out too well because I would like obsessively like wake up even more. And then, you know, like she's tired. I'm like, we're all exhausted, tired. Um, But obviously she went through a lot more than I did physically. We made it through like that one night. And then i think even like the next night but then by the third night she was like we couldn't we knew we it wasn't sustainable to do that two hours two hours on uh two hours off for each and like she would doze off but then i everybody says like sleep when the baby sleeps you know he'll be fine uh you know the doctors did the same thing especially if he swaddled you have nothing to worry about um, just make sure there's no like blankets or like pillows or anything else in the bassinet or the crib with him just make sure he's either on a flat surface or uh and or swaddled and that's it you can't nothing else don't worry about like propping his head up with a pillow like none of that um and if you do that you know their natural reflexes when they spit up at night which they do not every night but they do often enough um they'll like tilt their heads and 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 you know they're not gonna like choke on their like spit up or anything like that but you know no matter how much you hear like that type of stuff at least for me like i still freak out you know i still check if he's breathing every you know it felt like every like 15 minutes (laughs) and it was to the point where like i put i would put like i would like stare at his stomach and or like like his chest stomach area to make sure that i see it going like up and down and babies have like a an irregular breathing pattern that's what like the nurses and doctors told me before we left there it's not regulated like ours is 
and you know sometimes they'll breathe a little fast sometimes they'll like stop breathing or it'll seemingly they stop breathing and then they get like startled and then they continue breathing and i'm like you know is there something wrong like is he forgetting to breathe is it is, you know what is it and then they kind of like laughed me like shrugged it off kind of said it's completely normal that's you know just the baby's irregular sleep patterns and they normalize it after you know you know three or four months or whatever but so i can't so when he's sleeping i wind up put putting his like a pacifier like on his like belly um over his swaddle because that i can see more easily going up and down versus just seeing like the swaddle like blanket part going up and down and like that helped me a little bit to sleep a little bit but i really didn't start sleeping until i would say after the third i think it was the second night or the third night i want to say it's the third night because i was like literally on fumes like i had without exaggeration i probably slept four hours maybe five hours cumulative in those three days so i slept like one to one and a half hour a day and it was like in 15 20 minute increments like i'll sleep then i'll wake up and i'll check and then i'll stay up for a couple hours and which but that's like where i did some writing and some like audiobook listening podcast listening and stuff like that during that time um and i would go like get a snack get some uh oh funny funny story i went to get like some peanuts and i was like eating it and drinking some water and then like the bra- the baby was like breathing a little bit fast and i was like oh my god he has a nut allergy and i like took the nuts and then i ran them back to the kitchen and but it wasn't that i don't think um he was just like you know breathing irregular and or differently or whatever and i wonder how they do because they said he has no allergies or anything like that but do they test for shit like that like nut allergies and stuff i don't know anyway better safe than sorry um but anyway there came a point where i woke up and like jumped up in bed gasping for air and i couldn't get the air like i couldn't get air like my throat was literally closed like i couldn't breathe i tried through my nose i tried through my mouth and then i started getting like nervous and i was like (laughs) And I went up to my knees and I'm like patting my chest and I felt like I was choking. I was trying to like throw up because I thought like something like fell into my throat or something. Uh, uh, then I got like a, a burst of air probably lasted probably like 10 seconds and maybe less than that, maybe like seven or eight seconds, but it felt like longer and uh, I was scary as shit. And like th- then my, like my wife wakes up and She's, like, a little freaked out, but she's, like, not sure what's going on. And uh, the baby stayed sleeping, which was good, because I didn't want to, like, scare him or something. Um, and then I, I got some water. I checked my blood pressure. My blood pressure was high, because, I, like I told you guys, I have, like, high blood pressure. And then I checked it again. It was high again. And then, um, like, drinking water and trying to calm down and relax and and... You know, there was a few more hours until I had to, like, take my blood pressure pill. Um, which I hadn't forgotten to take or anything like that. So, I don't know what what was going on. It was just, like, very weird. It's the first time anything like that has happened to me. And then, um, well, like, of course, I still want to stay awake, check on the baby and stuff like that. And uh, while I'm awake, like, I, you know... Like we do now, you know, check WebMD, check other, you know, Google it, see if other people have like similar symptoms, what they say. And then they'll say, oh, I had this or I had that. Then you look up that and and see like what, you know, how it relates to you or whatever. Um, long story short, I think, I think, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, uh, but I do have a doctor's appointment next Saturday to just to make sure. But I think it's what seemed more related to what I was feeling um, was something called like a stress related sleep apnea that can be induced from uh, lack of sleep. And I definitely had lack of sleep and I was, you know, stressing out about the baby and stuff like that. Um, Sleep apnea, you know, it's like when you stop breathing uh, while you sleep. And I think that's what it was. Like I stopped breathing, woke up, gasped me for air, took a few seconds for me to like catch my breath. 
and um then from there on literally like that day i like slept during the day and uh, i've been meditating every single night which i hadn't done in i haven't haven't done regularly in months but i do like on and off like every like two weeks i'll remember and i'll do it for a night or two and then uh forget about it or whatever but i've been literally i think i'm like on a a 10 night streak like since that happened because i was you know like three days after the baby was born and um i've been meditating every night i've been sleeping more um more uh like my brother gave me advice of you know the baby is evolution will run its course like the baby's not uh uh he's strong enough if he's strong enough to turn over he's strong strong enough to turn over again plus you know we're not sleeping him with like any blankets or anything like that and uh my father-in-law also gave me similar advice he was like you know the baby's not it's not like he's gonna god forbid like choke and you're not gonna hear anything like he's not gonna move or something like he'll probably be very uncomfortable if god forbid something like that happened and you'll hear him rustling around or something um so you know i know a lot of people are saying like stuff like that more to like keep me at ease or get me at ease so that i'll be good um uh, but there's also like some truth behind it also you know and you know like the doctors recommend sleep when the baby sleeps so when he's sleeping during the day or at night or as long as he's sleeping he's swaddled you know you sleeping him on his back you have very 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 little risk of something happening and like all that advice together has been has helped to the point where um i'm sleeping a few hours a night now and i haven't had an episode like that since so my advice to anyone that is having a baby or you know going through uh the sleep sleepless nights experiences get to sleep where you can um because you are going to wake up anyway pretty regularly and i know no matter what i tell you you're probably gonna do your own thing anyway which just like i did just don't od like i did yeah in the very beginning you know the baby wakes up now it's like we went to our first doctor's appointment because you have to go to the pediatrician uh within the first week and we came home on monday we had our first pediatrician appointment on thursday and uh he measured the baby again checked the baby the baby was good he didn't have to get any shots that day because he got the hepatitis b shot in the hospital and which is the first shot that babies get um then a month later he has to go back and get the second part of that and then pretty much it's like a month after that he gets another set of shots etc um and everything you know i was like i couldn't wait to get to that first uh doctor's appointment because you know it's the pediatrician they deal with babies and once i get to that like goal post i'll feel much better and more much more at ease and that's what it was and um thankfully everything everything's been good since everything is beginning to normalize more uh according to the pediatrician he said to get the baby used to being awake in the day and sleep at night um he said don't worry about waking the baby up during the day we should wake him up every two hours and feed him his formula at least every uh every two hours during the day uh you know feed him whatever he'll take but you know at least half an ounce to an ounce just to get his internal clock going and his system moving around during the day and then at night let him sleep all he wants and then whenever he wakes up which he will and he does about two sometimes three times throughout the night uh to feed he you know feed him obviously you know feed him burp him change him put him back to bed and he's been pretty good like, he'll go to bed now, like, 11 or midnight, and he'll wake up, like, around 2 or 3. And then, if he wakes up at 2, he'll probably wake up again, like, around 4, 4.30. Sometimes he takes, like, a half hour to go back to sleep. Sometimes he takes, like, an hour. Sometimes he takes, the longest he's taken to go back to sleep after feeding is, like, an hour and a half, which is a pain. Uh, but then after that, then he'll wake up, like, at, you know, 7 or 8 in the morning. And... Uh, then you feed him again, and then he pretty much, like, sleeps all day. Like, you gotta wake him up to to feed. And it's gonna be like that for the first couple months. 
I guess, two to three months until he starts getting more into the flow of sleeping at night. Uh, what else? Formula, according to the doctor, you know, they give us like the ready mix formula, uh, the ready to drink formula, Similac. Pro Advanced is what he was drinking at the hospital, so I kept that the same because I have like different Similac versions. I kept the same one that he was drinking in the hospital, and I bought more of that the ready, ready to drink one. And until we were able to ask the pediatrician if there's a difference between the ready to drink and the powder, he said no. So I went with the powder, which is much more economical. And um, he's still on the Similac powder. We're going to eventually switch him off to like the Costco or BJ's brand, the Costco brand, um, which is comparative to uh, Infamil and Similac, which are the two, you know, predominant uh, baby formula formulas and like i checked like the ingredients list and it's pretty it's pretty much the same it's falls the costco version falls like right in between infamil and similac like it'll have a couple you know vitamin a it'll have you know two milligrams less and then it'll have two milligrams more of vitamin d and you know it's like within the same range and it's again between infamil and similac so which is more comforting for me like if it was like less than both of them i'll be like on a you know this is like a stripped down version of um but it's not it's like right in between and it has some things more and a few things less uh than similac but it has uh, most things more than infamil and so i'm comfortable with switching switching them over and my nieces both uh had those formulas that uh both formulas as well so uh, that's gonna be like the next mission. Cause it's crazy expensive, yo. Like a thirty-four ounce can of formula of Similac is like thirty-six, thirty-seven dollars, and the uh, Costco version of it's literally like half price. It's like nineteen bucks, eighteen bucks, and they go through formula a lot. It's, and now. It's in the beginning where he's have where he's drinking like two to three, sometimes four ounces if he's like super hungry and like fussy. Um, and you know he's already in two weeks he's already gone through more than than one of those cans. So the more he drinks, the more he's gonna go through it, and it's it's a lot. It's gonna be a couple hundred bucks a, a week on just fucking formula and diapers and shit. Diapers is another thing. Uh, eight to 12 i think they say like 8 to 10 but it's probably like 8 to 12 like diapers or oh, something funny that i was warned about but i just thought you know some kids probably do it some kids don't um boys and probably the same with girls but boys they when the air hits them they yeah when you take off the diaper they pee they tend to pee and he like pissed all over the wall pissed all over me a couple times pissed on my wife he pissed up and landed on his head um so it was funny so like you wind up uh me and my wife were like cracking up like the first time it happened because we like change them together like whenever we can um because he like freaks out and starts crying because he doesn't like when we take off his clothes and stuff he gets like cold and uncomfortable but yeah we were like cracking up the first time that happened he like started pissing everywhere and you wind up having to like grab another diaper and put it on top of him until he stops. So then, right there in one changing, you ruin you you ruin like three diapers. You know, the one he had on, the new one, and then the new new one that you put on. Shout out to the diaper genie, by the way. It's like a little trash bin thing that you put in the baby's room, like in, or wherever you change them, and you dump the diapers in there, and it like seals it up so it doesn't smell. So it's not like in your regular trash, like in your kitchen or whatever, and you don't smell anything. Uh, from it it's pretty economical like each it's easy to to use and each like roll of bags holds up to 270 diapers and you when the little bin gets filled you like just pull the the next layer of like trash bags like down like cut it with a scissor throw it away and then just tie the bottom and then continue doing that until the roll is done and it's pretty cool we did one of those uh, newborn photo shoots, which at first, like before the baby was born, I didn't want to do it. I thought it was like overkill. I told my wife I didn't think it's a good idea because, you know, baby won't have his shots, etc. 
and then I know a friend of mine that recently had a kid uh, a couple months ago and he did them and he said it was fine I told my wife you know I'll be okay with it if we ask the doctor and, and he's cool with it and we told the pediatrician and um he was funny he was like he was like a photo shoot what is the baby like modeling because if so i gotta i gotta fill out like these other this other like release papers to say that he's okay to model which he is but you know is he modeling already he already got a, got a job i was like <laughs> and we were laughing because obviously it wasn't that um but we told him you know it's just for you know newborn like portraits or whatever and he said it was fine he said as long you know it's even okay to take the baby out uh as long as like we he he advised that we put like the mosquito net around him which i got and to keep his hands covered because the babies put their hands in their mouth and most people they touch the baby they touch the baby's hands that's where most germs transfer and he'll put the his hand in his mouth and then he could get really sick from that um so we've been guarding against that you know first time parents you know spraying everybody with hand sanitizer telling everybody to clean their hands when they do come over keeping the baby's hands covered as much as possible and uh yeah we went to do this uh like newborn photo shoot thing and actually today we got um proofs of the pictures back and that was super cool uh they came out like super nice they it was like a three hour shoot that wound up taking almost six hours um because you're dealing with a newborn you know like they still have to feed they still have to be changed they still have to be comforted and swaddled and and you know like put to sleep so whenever you move him or take off his clothes or like change positions he gets like grumpy and doesn't like to be bothered and uh the photo shoot took forever but it was worth it we got a lot a lot of uh, nice pictures that my wife is really happy with that i'm happy with as well and i recommend that if you do it under those conditions you know uh, keep the baby's hands covered and don't let people touch your baby too much then you should be fine tomorrow is actually my first day back at work i had uh two weeks off of paternity leave and actually one week off of paternity leave and then i took one week off of vacation right after and um which i've been saving all year for this purpose of having the baby and tomorrow's my first day back to work which i'm freaking out about a bit but you know try not to od with the freaking out but my thankfully my wife's uh sister and brother-in-law are gonna come and they're gonna help my wife and uh she's not gonna be completely alone so that is a good thing but it's gonna suck because i'm gonna use the the little guy most people like co-workers and stuff and other people i've spoken to they like they told me like after the two weeks you're gonna be like dying to go back to work you're gonna be like over the whole thing and um like the opposite i feel like quitting my job and <laughs> just so i could like stay home with the baby but alas diapers and formula are expensive so i cannot do that but if you'd like to help me towards my goal, you can go to sponsorday.com forward slash affiliate links and help support the Sponsorday podcast by clicking on the Amazon banner, doing your shopping like you normally do, or becoming a Patreon, a patron of the Sponsorday podcast by going to patreon.com forward slash Sponsorday. Did you see what I did there? I'm trying to guilt you guys into supporting my idea of quitting work and staying home with my child. Oh, fuck it, whatever works, right? Anyway, uh, that's pretty much it, guys. Just wanted to gush a bit over having a kid and tell you guys a bit about my experience and maybe any of you going through or about to go through the same thing can find some thing useful from from all that. And lastly, to my son, Aiden, I'd like to say... Thank you for blessing us. And I can't pretend that I'm going to know what to do in every single situation. But I'm absolutely up for the challenge of raising you in the best way that I'll know how. I'm sure your mother will as well. And I promise to be here for you in every way that I can be. 
Love you, buddy. And that, folks, was episode 211 of the Spun Today podcast. The Welcome Baby Aiden throwback episode. And to my baby boy Aiden, who is turning four years old today, if and when you listen to this when you're older one day, I just want to tell you that no matter how much life tries to harden you, and trust me, it definitely will try, never let it harden you to the point that you lose that sweet, sensitive, kind essence of yours. Happy birthday, papito. I love you. What's up, folks? Tony here. I hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as I enjoy producing it for you. Here are a few quick ways you can help support this show. You can support the Spun Today podcast by going to spuntoday.com forward slash support. There you'll find my merch section where you can cop the iconic podcasts versus anybody t-shirt in a wide variety of different colors and all different sizes. Also, if you're into cycling, you can cop the super soft, comfortable, minimalist design Spun Today Bike Club t-shirt. Also available in a bunch of different colors and all different sizes. There are a few other designs of different types of t-shirts. Definitely go there and check it out. SpunToday.com forward slash support. It's the merch section. We can also get a dope coffee mug. I have coffee mugs with the brand new redesigned Spun Today logo on one side and the tagline that I end every show with on the other, which is start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams. The mug is available in both black and white because we don't discriminate here at the Spun Today podcast. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash support and check out the merch section. You can support the Spun Today podcast by checking out my writing. You can go to spuntoday.com forward slash free writing and check out some of my free association writing, which is intended to be some cathartic free writing, but oftentimes doubles down as motivation for myself and others. At spuntoday.com forward slash short stories, you can read a bunch of the different short stories that I've written and actually listen to the audiobook versions of those short stories there as well. Another way you can help support my writing is by going to spuntoday.com forward slash books and checking out what I have in store for sale. Digital copies are available in all formats, whether it be Kindle, iBooks, or a different type of e-reader. You can also purchase paperback copies if that's your preferred reading method. Currently available, I have my nonfiction, Make Way For You, which is a collection of freely written thoughts that were curated and put together as tips for getting out of your own way. Also available is my debut time travel novel titled Fractal. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash books to show your support. Support the Spun Today podcast by following me on social at Spun Today on Twitter, at Spun Today on Instagram. Please also check out and like my Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Spun Today and subscribe to my YouTube page as well. On my YouTube page, not only will you get these full length episodes, but you'll also get to check out some chopped up clips and bonus content. To get to my YouTube page, just search Spun Today on YouTube or click on any of the YouTube icons on the footer of my website. Also, don't forget to rate and review this podcast wherever it is that you're listening. It really does help. The Spun Today newsletter is available to each and every one of my listeners absolutely for free. All you have to do is go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe and drop in your email address. What I'm going to do is brighten up everybody's least favorite day of the week by delivering five curated things within my weekly newsletter every Monday at noon. You're going to receive a photo of the week, a recommended podcast of the week. I listen to tons of podcasts from an array of varied interests. I cherry pick the very best ones so that you can check them out. I also share a video of the week, which can be anything from a tasty recipe to a dope rap battle to an enlightening TED talk. I also share a quote of the week. And finally, for my fellow wordsmiths out there, a word of the week so that you can step up your vocab. Again, this curated list is yours absolutely free by going to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe and dropping in your email address and you can unsubscribe at any time. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe, drop in your email address, and you'll get the very next one. If you want to help support the Spun Today podcast financially, you can do so by going to spuntoday.com forward slash support. Here you'll find a few different ways that you can do so. 
you can shop on Amazon. But first, go to my website, spuntoday.com forward slash support. Click on the Amazon banner, which will take you to Amazon's website where you do your shopping like you normally do. It will not cost you anything extra, but I will get credit for driving traffic to their website. Another cool way that you can help support this show is through Patreon, where you can set up reoccurring donations to my podcast, whether it be $1 per show, $2 per show, etc. And depending on how much you choose to pledge, you will receive some Patreon perks in return. Things like free writing pieces, free bookmarks, free digital copies of my books, etc. Again, my Patreon link can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash support. You can also set up similar reoccurring payments via my Ko-fi page. And if you want to send a one-time happiness bomb donation, if you will, you can do so via my PayPal link. Again, all of which can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash support. If you're a fellow creative, a cool way that you can help support the Spun Today podcast and actually be part of the podcast is by filling out my five question questionnaire located at spuntoday.com forward slash questionnaire. Here you'll find the five open questions related to your craft, your art, what inspires you to create, what type of unrelated hobbies you're into, and what motivates you to get your work done. You can choose to remain anonymous or plug your website and your work. And once you submit your questionnaire, I read your responses on a future episode of the Spun Today podcast. It's completely free at no cost to you. And what I like to say about it is that if your responses could potentially spark inspiration in someone else, why not share that? spuntoday.com forward slash questionnaire. And as always, folks, substitute the mysticism with hard work and start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams. Thanks for listening. I love you, Aiden. I love you, Daddy.